Okay, so this is the second and final lecture on this topic. Um, so let me recap uh, what I talked about on Tuesday. Um, first of all, we talked about the OPE and the light cone limit. So um, the dominant low t the dominant contribution to the OP and the light cone limit are the low twist operators. Those are the, the contribution coming from the stress tensor uh, consists of T and U derivatives of null derivatives of, of T U U. Um, so we got this formula that the uh, null energy operator is showing up uh, as the leading term. I talked about how um, there's a relationship between several different things, four of them. Okay, so one of them is the, is the four-point function in the light cone limit. That's a picture that I drew last time. I just drew it a little neater up there. So there's a four-point function of light cone limit. Um, the dominant contribution comes from this ANIC operator. This is related to geodesic, uh, the, to a geodesic length uh, space-like separation in ADS. And um, if you're allowed to use ADS-CFT, it's also related to the time delay for physical particle propagation. Finally, we talked about analyticity, and um, the, the simplest version of the statement is that the four-point function is analytic when the um, times are imaginary time-ordered. So in terms of pictures like this, uh, and also the, the two-point function picture that I drew at the end last time, I'm, I like to think of the out of the board as the plus i epsilon and, and into the board as the minus i epsilon or vice versa. Um, so when I was talking about going around, going around these cuts, um, I was talking about how we order these things in imaginary time. So today we're going to finish the derivation of the NX sum rule, prove the NX, uh, and then discuss the relation to the inversion formula. Okay, so we talked about the analytic structure of the two-point function, and now we want to turn to the four-point function. As before, um, when you insert an operator, it creates branch points um, coming on its light cone. So like the branch points that you get, so we're thinking of this four-point function as a function of u and v, and uh, this O insertion here is going to create branch points along its light cone. So there's some branch points here. Uh, the same thing for the O operator over here. Okay, and then the way to think about uh, this correlator is that it's a function, um, oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's a function that you have to, um, you have to decide if you're above or below these branch cuts. Okay, and, and the branch cut goes both forward and backward, but I'm only going to draw the forward one there and the backward one here because that's all that matters. Um, so, as, so as we're moving these psi operators around, um, you know, if we're, if we're moving them around here where everything's space-like separated, then we can just stick them in Minkowski space. There's no ambiguity. That corresponds to the fact that everything, there's no commutators, there's no operator ordering. But as soon as we go past these branch, branch cut planes, uh, we have to decide, are we putting the operators on top? Are we putting them underneath? Are we putting one on top and one underneath? Um, and so on. Okay. So um, this operator ordering here um, says that we want one of the size so the, these two operators are time-like separated, and these two operators are time-like separated. And uh, the fact that, that one, is, one goes psi O and the other one goes O psi uh, means that we want one of these pairs, and, and one of them we want psi in front of O, and the other one we want psi behind O. Okay, so the function that we're talking about when we draw this operator ordering is a function is the function defined where, let's say, let's say this one is in front of the board, slightly in front, 
and uh, this one is slightly behind. So this one has a plus i epsilon, that one has a minus i epsilon. Does this make sense? Uh, stop me now with questions, maybe. Okay, so, um, now as I told you before, we're going to integrate the correlation function on a closed contour. So the next thing I want to do is draw that contour. Uh, the contour has three pieces. Um, the first piece is in Minkowski space. Okay, so the first piece of the contour uh, is over an orbit of the boost generator. Like that. Okay, so, so we're going to integrate. We have this psi insertion here. Um, we're going to integrate along this curve. Uh, while maintaining the insertion here is, it, is, is, is reflected. Okay, so when we're doing the integral, what we're really doing is we're taking both of the operators, they start here, and then we integrate the correlator along this contour like that. And all, the t all, all along, we're, we're keeping this one in the back uh, of the branch cut and this one in the, front of, in the front of the branch cut. Okay, so we're integrating like that. Let me call that... Um, where's my chalk? So let me call that piece, let's make these pink. Okay, so that piece is going to be called one. Um, and while we're doing that, this operator is also moving, so I'll draw it here. One. Um, and then we're going to do a contour that comes out of the board into the imaginary direction and closes up and we're going to close this contour by doing a, a rotation in the imaginary, into the imaginary direction. Okay, so the way to get from this point, these are Rindler reflections of each other. So the way to get from this point here to that point there is just to go to Rindler coordinates and do a rotation. Okay, so the rotation takes us out of the board to there. I can't really draw that. Um, There it is. It's coming out of the board. Yeah. One of us are be, well, behind the uh, branch cut and the other one in the front, so we have to pass through the branch cut, right? No, we're not going to pass through the branch cut. Um, good point. So let me come back to that. If it still doesn't make sense in a minute, then, then ask me again. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me, let me draw the third piece, and then I'll, I'll explain this better. So if, if I had been at time zero, then you would know what that means. It's just that we go to Euclidean signature, do a rotation, and then we, we've done it. Uh, when we're boosted, it's a little more complicated, and I'll, draw, and I'll write the equation in a minute. Okay, and then we need to close this contour at infinity. This piece actually is not going to contribute, but that's okay. So this is the contour we're going to integrate over, and uh, the key equation is this one. Okay, so the analyticity properties that we discussed last time um, ensure that this is analytic, uh, and we're going to take the real part just basically as a trick to get the thing that we want. No, it's not. Um, well, it's it's going to be important for other things I do, but that's not why the contour is closed. So um, this is why I need my volunteers? Okay, so I need volunteers to be these operators, and I'm going to explain this <laughs> contour better. So um, maybe, can I take some people from the front, Regu and Scott maybe, or? Okay. Um, it is a closed contour. It is a, it is a closed contour, and I'm going to explain why. Okay, wait, this, this branch cut is this one? Okay, so that's, that's you. But the you, what? I, I'm, about to t I'm about to explain it. So can you hold that right there? Okay, so, so this is the operator insertion of the O, and um, Regu is going to be this branch cut. Okay. Um, so here's what's happening. We, we start with the, the initial point had one in front, 
and one behind, right? Okay, and then we're going to move this one down while that one goes up. And then we're going to rotate both of them like this. Okay, and then we're going to slide back down the boost generator. And then we're going to rotate them back. Contours closed. This is where I started. Checks out. <laughs> did, did that answer the, there were, did that answer the questions people had? Or, what? <laughs> and, and I really, I actually, it's important to keep track of where you started any time that you're saying where you are on some branch cut. So like when I picture this in my head, I really picture it more like this. Okay, so you, you have to imagine that the operator started being, being in, in the space-like region and that you attach them to a wire and then you move them to where they are so that this wire is remembering where they came from. Okay, so you move them out, and then you, 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 you boost them, you rotate the wire, um, and then you close them like that. That's the contour. <laughs> yes, the third way is the equation, so that's <laughs> what I'm going to give now. Yes, the pink path is the first, is the contour of the first point. The problem is that the, the upper part is where this one is that this is for the second point. Um, yeah, that one's behind. Okay, good. So the, f the first point, this point, is moving on the pink path. At the same time, the other operator, which started behind the cut here, is moving on the green path. Um, well, they're, okay, they're on top of, they're at the same point on this blackboard, but one's in front of the cut and the other's behind. But I agree with what you're saying, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that one? No, I really mean one. And that, and ask, you can, you can ask me again later, but if I wrote the Euclidean correlator there, um, if I wrote psi O, psi O here, which is the other ordering that you're asking me about, then this would not be an analytic function on that domain. Uh, because if you took this function and you tried to do what I just did, you would, for, you would find that you ended up um, trying, to, trying to go through the, the planes. Because, you know, they, say they would both start in the front, in that case. Then you would go out this way, and now what would you do? You try to rotate them, and you can't do it. You ha you're, forced to go through the, you're forced to go through the plane. So there is no analytic, fun so there is no analytic function in this Upper, this is going to be an upper half plane eventually. There is no analytic function in the upper half plane, which is equal to the Euclidean correlator on the boundary value. So we can't put the Euclidean correlator in there. OK. Um, so let me give the equation. It's also 0. Okay, so to describe this contour, uh, I'm going to let u equal 1 over sigma, v equal minus eta sigma, and assume that eta is much less than 1. Then it's a contour in the sigma plane. which looks um, something like this. Um, I guess I forgot to label the other pieces here. Let me label them. Where did my pink go?
So here was one, I'll call this two, and call this three. On the sigma contour, um, real sigma is Minkowski space, right? Because that's just real coordinates. Okay, so, th so the real part of the contour, which I called one, is this piece. Um, and since I've done an inversion here, u is one over sigma, um, basically the big piece here is the little piece there, so this is three. And then there's a little piece around the origin, um, which I've shrunk to zero, and that's two. Um, okay. On this piece of the contour, so here's in words what we're going to do. So this is this is the same this is the same contour. I've just defined it explicitly now, and this also answers the question of what exactly I mean by going out of the board. So this is this is what I mean. Um, okay, so the strategy now is the following. On, on this piece of the contour, we're going to use the OPE. On this piece of the contour, uh, we can't use the OPE. This is approaching the uh, reg A singularity, and, and we can't use the OPE there. Uh, but um, that's okay. We're just going to write the, write the sum rule for the OPE term in terms of an integral here. So the OPE term is um, that real part, um, just the real part of an integral over a semicircle is basically just going to pick up a residue. OK, so we're going to end up picking a residue of eta over sigma O integral T O. So what have I done here? Um, I just used that OPE. The u squared v becomes eta over sigma. And then we're integrating that over the contour. Um, so we're just going to pick up that residue. And the answer is eta times the anec. Can you call the second sigma plane? Yeah. Well, cuts are wherever you put them. Um, oh, wait, the points? Which points? Yeah, there's a branch point at zero. Uh, there's one at one. And let's see, the other one's either, yeah, the other one's at infinity. What do you mean by you're picking up a residue? This is not a closed contour. Yeah. The real part of the integral over a semicircle uh, if it's an analytic function, is just going to be the same as, as the, the closed contour um, on, the, on the circle. Now, there are non-analytic pieces. So it's important that there are also non-analytic pieces of this function. This function um, has power. So if we were to keep all the terms in the OPE, there would be subleading terms with non-integer powers. But those are subleading, and uh, we don't have to worry about them for this argument. So as far as this argument goes, it really is just an analytic function near the origin, and we're picking up the residue of the analytic function. On this piece of the contour, um, I'm going to rewrite this in terms of the double discontinuity. So the integrand on this piece of the contour is the real part of 1 minus g Um, so I've now told you what the conformal cross ratios are in this situation. Um, I never talked about the conformal cross ratios before. I was just talking about this um, in, in space-time language, but the conformal cross ratios are just z bar equals eta sigma and z equals sigma. Now, um, this 1 minus g, we can rewrite as a commutator. So what have I done here? 
uh, well, one of these terms in the commutator is just G. It's that, it's the correlator ordered as written. Uh, the other piece in here uh, is the other ordering. The other ordering uh, is just the Euclidean correlator, because it's just the correlator evaluated at small cross ratios without going through any cuts. And the Euclidean correlator near the origin is just one. Okay. So I've, I've just done a trick here. I've just taken this one here and rewritten it as the other correlator. Um, um, yes, sigma small. Yeah, the, the sigma on, this, on the radius, on the, on the semicircle. But what does this mean to determine the position of part of G? Uh, it, means that, it means that we can't, we have to do this loop um, in such a way that we don't come too close to this, we don't want to come too close to this uh, branch point on that loop. Um, it's just the limit, it's the same limit um, that we use to get rid of the kernel in this equation. It's really we want to work on this, this thing simplifying this double limit where you first take v small and u large. So that corresponds to the u large in this, in the derivation of this equation. Okay, now this quantity that I've um, written here, yeah. So I think it is possible to integrate up to the, completely up to the cut, and I wonder if that maybe cancels with respect that instead of one, you have discrepancy between one and the Euclidean quarter. Um, is that possible? I think, it, I think that, yeah, what we mean by, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really have to be small. It's really just eta sigma that has to be small. So I, I guess you're right. We can, we can bring this all the way up to the cut. It doesn't cancel with, with the thing you're worried about, though. I really don't think that you can use the other correlator until you get to the next step. Okay. Um, Uh, let's see. I think as long as sigma is less than one, so it, as, as long as sigma is less than one and not approaching one in a way that interferes with the eta expansion, then we're fine. So, we can integrate all the way to one, but with the understanding that you're supposed to first take eta small uh, and then do this integral. So this combination here, the real part of the commutator, is the, is the double discontinuity. This is the definition of the double discontinuity. Um, it's a double commutator, psi comma O, psi comma O, which is D disk. So the conclusion is that uh, these two terms have to be op equal and opposite in order for them to integrate to zero. So you get a sum rule that says that the NEC contribution is equal uh, up to some coefficient that you can calculate uh, from minus one to one, d sigma, d disk, g of z bar equals eta sigma, z equals sigma, um, and there was a, so there was, now we have to worry about the eta dependence. So this had, we're, we're always working in the small eta limit. This had an eta on the left-hand side. 
I'm going, to re I'm going to rewrite that slightly as the following. Okay, so what I mean is that we're supposed to calculate this thing on the right at small eta and pick off the 1 over eta term. By the sum rule, there's guaranteed to be such a term, and uh, we're supposed to pick off that term. Yeah. But why is G? I don't know if it's in the lower two complex. It's not, but the leading contributions in this limit are analytic there. And that's important. So the point is as long as G is very small, you're fine. Yes. Okay. There are subleading contributions that are not analytic, and that's important. Um, and those will give terms that aren't just a residue integral, and they'll be non zero, but they'll be subleading. It yeah. seems like we get the same rule that you wrote, but formally it looks like we're getting some rule where integral is from minus sigma max to sigma max. That's right. All of the contributions to this integral yeah. come from the region where sigma is order eta or less. So I've written it minus 1 to 1, okay. but we could just, just as well write it minus 0.1 to point 0.1, and they all come from near the origin. What? I, I've written it this way to make it look more like the inversion formula, um, but you know the way we originally wrote it was minus epsilon to epsilon. Okay. Sigma is still bigger than eta, right? Not inside this integral. Okay, so so, so on the, out here, so that's the important thing is that out here sigma is bigger than eta, and that's why you're allowed to use the OPE because eta is going to zero with everything else held fixed. But when you do this integral, you're necessarily going to integrate across the point where sigma is much less than eta. That's the regge pole, and that's where the contributions to the sum rule come from. OK, so the last step in the proof of the ANEC um, is unitarity. Um, and unitarity is going to imply that the integral, the integrand on the right-hand side uh, is positive. So I want to explain that sort of um, slowly and starting from the beginning um, just to go through it carefully. Other questions before I explain that? Yes. Yeah. Did you say that the minus 1 is the right side? Oh, I missed, sorry, I missed the minus 1. No, I didn't. Sorry, what's the, what was the question? So you, you have this vertical line on the right where the theta of the contribution is equal to the minus one. Oh, yeah. So it's basically just the reading term on this side? And the small is the reading term? Um, yeah, that's right. There might be exceptions to that when there are light scalars, but I don't want to talk about them right now. We could talk about them later. They're sort of, some, sort of confusing. Um, positivity of the integrand, you mean, doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so let me start with reflection positivity, which I think probably everyone has seen earlier in, uh, earlier this week. So reflection positivity is just the statement in Euclidean signature. Um, when I draw these boxes, those are Euclidean. That's the Euclidean plane. OK, so my boxes are Euclidean planes. Uh, this is imaginary time tau. And reflection positivity just says that if you take the uh, Euclidean plane and you cut it in half and insert things symmetrically across that plane, they could be local operators, they could be non-local operators, whatever, as long as everything is uh, symmetric across the plane, that this is a positive, um, that this correlation function is positive. So this, I think you've seen, um, it's just the statement that the path integral is, well, it's the statement that the action is real. 
So when you do this path integral, uh, you end up with a mod squared of something because you have to, the top is the conjugate of the bottom, um, therefore you get a positive number. Well, okay, I'm assuming parity. When parity is violated, then um, you have to have the right eyes to make up the contribution of the sign flips. But, but that's enough. <laughs> okay, maybe we can talk about it after then. Um, so in terms of operators, um, for example, if we insert two operators uh, and we give one of them a dagger, then uh, we get something positive where we have to be careful what this dagger means. Okay, so this dagger means that O of tau x dagger is O of minus tau star x star. Okay, I put those stars in there in case we're not in Euclidean signature. If we're in Euclidean signature, you can ignore the stars. Um, but it's this minus tau star. This is what ensures that, that Lorentzian times don't get, don't get flipped under this conjugation. So we just flip the uh, Euclidean time. We don't flip Lorentzian time. Okay, um, now... over here. We can pick any plane to do this reflection. Um, so, for example, this is still Euclidean time, but we can do the reflection across the vertical plane, across the vertical line. It's just Euclidean space is totally the same. Um, and that means that this, for example, this four-point function is positive. Because the insertions are uh, reflection symmetric about uh, that vertical line. Now, in Euclidean language, what I'm saying on this board and what I said on that board are just completely the same thing. But in Lorentzian language, these are very different. So in Lorentzian language, uh, this picture that I'm drawing now uh, is a picture like this, where things are symmetric in the y direction, in the space direction, instead of being symmetric in the Euclidean time direction. It's a question? Um, in this case, I'm doing, putting them on tau equals zero, that's right. So that way I can also give a Lorentzian interpretation to exactly the same picture. So this Lorentzian four-point function is positive. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because there's no way to interpret. So let me go back here. In, in this case, what I was saying about the path integral, that's just the statement that a path integral on, the, on a half plane prepares a state, and on the upper half plane, it prepares the ket. So when you do reflection positivity, what you're saying is that, norm, is that norms are positive. But here we have a positivity property that you can't interpret in terms of any norm. So this is not any physical norm. There's no state psi in this quantum field theory uh, whose norm is this four-point function. When you take operators and you insert them in, in, in the physical Minkowski space-time, you don't make states. You know, these are not normalizable. If we were to take these two operators and hit them with dagger, they wouldn't even move. Right? So if we took these two operators, hit them with dagger, we, they wouldn't even move. And then if we tried to calculate a correlator, we'd just get infinity. Okay, so there's a positivity property 
in quantum field theory um, that doesn't correspond to any obvious physical norm in the physical theory. Now, it is a physical norm in another sense. It's a, physical, it's a norm in the sense that we could go back to Euclidean signature, define states on this line, and it's a norm in that theory. But those aren't quantum states in, uh, in, this, in the usual sense of quantum states in the quantum field theory. You can also time evolve the picture, time evolve the operators in that picture that I have over there. Um, and that gives you the following. It tells you that if you have operators inserted symmetrically, let me call the symmetric reflections, the Rindler reflections, I'll denote with a bar. Um, so it tells you that correlation functions like this are positive for a particular operator ordering. Okay, so now things are time-like separated, and we have to be careful about, about the ordering here. But there is an ordering, which I'll call the positive ordering, Uh, where these uh, correlation functions are positive real numbers. So the correct ordering is this one, O bar psi bar O psi. Why this ordering? Well, you just have to go, th you have to go back to here stick in some i epsilons, and then hit the operators with e to the i h t, um, and keep track of what happens to the i epsilons. And that'll give you this prescription, but I won't go through that. The definition of bar here uh, was implicit in this picture, but let me write it explicitly. The definition of bar, O of t, y, x perp bar is O of minus t star minus y star x perp star. That is, in Minkowski language, we reflect t and y then everything also gets conjugated. No, it's not a boost. Yeah, so, um, this, this relationship so the relationship is that here I, I was inserting um, O of, I was inserting the operator O of X at that point. Um, but if I instead insert the operator e to the i h t, o of x e to the minus i h t um, at that point, then I get that picture. And um, by keeping track of what happens under complex conjugation and putting some i epsilons in, that's how you get the prescription that I'm saying now in terms of the ordering. The other funny thing about this, uh, this bar operation uh, is that when you have two operators, O1, O2, and you um, bar them, they don't flip. Okay, they're O1 bar, O2 bar. Okay, it's very tempting to try to flip the order of, of the operators here, but if you keep track of the I epsilons, that's not what happens. Uh, and that's why the positive ordering is, is this one. It's the one where we have, we just order the, 
and this works for higher point functions as well. You just order them. You have the ones on the left Rindler wedge that are ordered exactly the same as the ones on the right Rindler wedge. Yeah. That's Rindler positivity. That's Rindler positivity. Yeah, so, wedge re so in Cassini's language, reflect wedge reflection positivity is something that applies when everything is space-like on the two sides. And he doesn't really give a name to the other thing, right. but I'm calling it Rindler positivity. So he, he gives this argument for Rindler positivity that involves the Fisher technology. That's right. Um, I think that's just a fancy way of doing epsilons. Um, I mean, for the purposes of this, of this argument. I mean, if you're, if, put it this way, the C Cassini, compared to what I just said, is like bisignano wickman compared to what we always do in Rindler space. It's, this is the path integral version of that. I think it's, I think it's the same conclusion. Um, let me just say the conclusion, I think, is the same, and we can discuss later. Yeah. I, yeah. I, as far as I know, I'm sure there are other things concluded there, but as far as this discussion of this thing being positive, I think it's the same. That's the ordinary. Uh, wait, no. Let's see. Um, It doesn't matter. You, you, this is the ordinary Hamiltonian, because I put a T in there. But you can do it either way. If, as long as you're on a manifold with a Z2 symmetry, you could do exactly what you just said. It has to, I mean, the manifold itself has to have the symmetry, and then the operators that you insert on it have to have the symmetry. In conformal field theory, there's, can I imagine another one? Um, yes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all just unitarity in the end, but it can manifest itself in funny ways. Like in conformal theory, in conformal field theories, you can get positivity conditions on time-like separated points by by doing things like this, um, which are not obviously related to the ones that have written, but secretly they are. Uh, you must have used to read in the Hamiltonian somewhere, because otherwise I don't understand why by moving things around, you always end up with point psi and O in the Riddler on, on, on this way. Why couldn't, if you're just allowed to move it around, then why couldn't you move it all the way up? So if I move this up, um, then the point is that an, an operator here can still be viewed as an operator in the right Rindler wedge. I just, so this operator uh, is the same as some non-local operator here. I've just evolved it with the Hamiltonian. And as long as I have operators in the Rindler wedges, I can do this reflection. If I were to move this all the way up to here, then I just can't even think of that as an operator in the Rindler wedge, so then it fails. But that's, the, that's my question. You said, well, 
was just to create some echoes and move things around and you'll get your on the nose of the superior. But then, you know, what stops you from moving? You know, you've said there's a T, there's another differentiator T there, is that EHT or F, and you can see that arbitrary and just pick some epsilon. So let's just vary that T from minus infinity to infinity and stick in some epsilon. What will tell me that the end point where the operator only went up will always fit in the ring derivative? When, when you act on an operator yeah. with, a, with a Hamiltonian, yeah. it, it no, it's no longer really a local operator. It's, it starts to get bigger okay. as you act on it with the Hamiltonian. Okay. And what I've used here is that I needed to stay, I needed to still be an operator on this piece of the space time. Yeah. Yeah. So to apply this to the D disk, um, we can use the fact that this defines for us a positive inner product. The inner product uh, for two operators A and B is just A bar B. This is defined for operators that live in a single Rindler wedge. So let's say operators in the right Rindler wedge. So um, under this inner product, uh, A has positive norm, and that means that you get Cauchy-Schwarz inequalities. So Cauchy-Schwarz says that if you have a positive inner product, then um, the norm of AB is less than or equal to the norm of A, norm of B, which um, in this case means the square root of A bar A, B bar B. What this means is the following. So let me say this in words first. When you have operators that are reflection symmetric like this, there are lots of orderings that you can write. One of, is, one of them is positive, a positive real number, and all the others are bounded by that one. So when things are reflection symmetric, um, the, nice, the, the, the positive ordering is positive, the others are bounded. So this bounds other orderings. And in our case, the important one um, was the real part of O bar psi bar psi O. Um, this is not positive ordered. This is one of the other ones because the, the, I flipped them. Um, but this is less than the absolute value of itself. And then we apply Cauchy-Schwarz. So this is less than um, the square root of O bar psi bar O psi psi bar O bar psi O. These two operators are actually the same because these things are, um, well, they're, they're conjugates, conjugates of each other, but they're real. So you could check um, that these are actually the same. So this gives you um, O bar psi bar O psi. And if you rearrange this equation, um, then this says that the real part of the commutator is positive. (coughs) 
So the D disk is positive. Yeah, you could do it that way. That's also true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Sorry? You'd rather just write it as the real part of the commutator? Yeah. But they're equal, so. Um, okay. I mean, they're they're the same. They're the same. the The real part of the single disk is the is the double disk. Yeah, the imaginary part is also less than the absolute value. But um, what show the reason I did it this way uh, is because it bounds what c conveniently shows up on the underneath blackboard. Uh, which was a sum rule for the ANEC. So we related to the, the ANEC to the double disk, and now unitarity has been invoked to show that that's positive. Um, so putting it all together, the conclusion is the ANEC. Um, so this integral T is a positive operator. Here? <coughs> yes, and that'll just give you back. So this is some, this thing that's showing up here is some OPE coefficient in, in OOT. And if you're to take the Rege ansatz and stick it here, um, no, actually, I'm not sure what's going to, it's yeah, so that's happening at the origin of this integral. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen. It's the same question as for the inversion formula, so it'll work out similarly there if you know the question there, but I don't, I, uh, the answer there, but I don't. So you can't use the leading reg. Oh, maybe you can. I'm not sure. But it definitely depends on the whole reg behavior. It's in a yeah. trivial way. It's not a tautology. Um, okay. I I mostly agree, but now I'm going to show that it is. Okay. So that's and that's the last part of what I wanted to talk about, <laughs> um, which is the relationship to the inversion formula. Um, okay. Um, so uh, I've been uh, I've been going back and forth about talking about four point function. Sometimes I've been talking about four point functions of primaries. Um, other times, I just let O be any operator at all. Um, the argument works for any operator O, and that means that it's a positive operator. Maybe you're upset about the fact that that's not really the expectation value in a state. Is that what's bothering you? I was going to gloss over that, but I could go into it. Um, I agree with that. It might not mean that. It's only been demonstrated on a dense subset. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I just haven't thought about whether that implies the more general statement. But where did you use the four was a local operator? At some point you were talking about cross ratio. 
Um, so if you want to produce for any R, then it won't change? Uh, nothing really. I just can't write Z and Z bar. It's exactly the same. I just shouldn't call it Z and Z bar because there aren't really cross ratios. Uh, in conformal field theory, I think we know that inserting operators gives everything. Uh, well, that's okay. Not necessarily on the plane. Um, okay, we can we can talk about that later. Okay, so now I want to discuss the relation to the inversion formula. Um, mostly, this is just going to be review to the extent that I say anything new. Um, this is. Um, some calculations that uh, Amir and I worked out recently. So um, for, the, for the present purposes, um, I want to specialize just to a scalar four-point function uh, of identical scalars. And the conformal block expansion in the S channel is C sum over C squared delta L, G delta L of ZZ bar. And um, I want to try to invert. OK, so let me, let me say what, where we're going with this. I'm going to try to invert this sum in a very simple-minded way. OK, so the usual derivation of the inversion formula uh, is sophisticated. I'm going to give a simple-minded derivation of the inversion formula. Um, the advantage is that it's very simple-minded and doesn't require thinking. The disadvantage I'll come to later, but it's, it's sort of only going to derive the answer as an asymptotic sum, not the full answer. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the terms in the sum, and I'm going to say, OK, if we want to pick off a particular OPE coefficient, then we should just look how it contributes to this sum and cook up an integral that picks off that particular OPE coefficient. Okay, this is like a totally natural way to try to derive this. Um, but isn't the usual, this is not the usual method, and there's a good reason for that that I'll explain. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is take 1 minus z uh, around the cut. So I'm going to take z around the t-channel pole. Then I'm going to take, um, well, at the same time, I'm going to take z bar much less than z, uh, much less than 1. This is exactly the limit that we've been discussing all along in the context of the light cone OPE. And I'm going to write, uh, as we did before, z bar equals eta sigma and z equals sigma. OK, so now I'm just going to evaluate this sum. It diverges, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's a good asymptotic expansion in the light cone limit. Um, so then um, it's easy to evaluate these, these conformal blocks in this limit. You know, in general, we don't know the formula for the conformal block. Uh, but in this limit, we do know the formula for the conformal block in any number of dimensions. And what you get is a sum that looks like this. There's a 1 from the identity. I've normalized things, so the identity is a 1 plus i sum over delta L kappa inverse delta plus L. That's just some gamma functions that have been defined earlier, in, um, earlier this week. Uh, we, don't, we don't need it. Um, times eta to the tau over 2 over sigma to the L minus 1. Let me dwell on this term for a second. OK, so we're doing a light cone expansion in eta, which is an expansion in twist. So uh, the, the contribution of a given operator is uh, um, eta to the twist. Tau is delta minus L. On the bottom, this comes from going around the cut. So on the first sheet, if we were to expand in blocks, we wouldn't find negative powers of sigma like this. 
but uh, when you take a block and you go to the second sheet, you get enhancement uh, 1 over sigma to the L minus 1. And this is something that you can just check by, um, for example, taking the uh, SL2 blocks, the light cone blocks, and just using hypergeometric identities to go around the cut and expanding those hypergeometric functions near zero. There are corrections to this which are important. Um, so this, the corrections are 1 plus integer powers of eta and sigma. Um, and then there are also non-integer power corrections to this. So there are also uh, new non-analyticities, uh, but none that come uh, with these enhancements in sigma. So we're working at small sigma, and the enhanced terms are uh, of this form. Yeah. I just took the. I don't think that's a theorem. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any theorem. I would say this is kind of what we always do with Feynman diagrams and and stuff. Is when when we have a, an expansion in a small parameter, um, we trust it as long as the subsequent terms are much smaller than the previous terms. Um, I'm going to assume that that's true, but I'm not going to prove that, and there could be subtleties in that assumption. Um, that's right, but I'm taking this limit where the series is controlled in eta. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to, we can include as many as we want. I think you're worried about the accumulation point. At some point, we have to include an infinite number of them. Um, I'm just going to ignore that. We could say that I'm only working below the accumulation point, uh, although, oddly, I'm going to end up getting the full inversion formula, so this will be enough. If you want a, a, more, a, a, a better definition of what's showing up here, um, then it's useful to think of this in terms of the Casimir equation. So we started with a solution of the Casimir equation, an eigenfunction of the Casimir equation, and we went around a pole. So we still have an eigenfunction of the Casimir equation, and um, this function here that's showing up, I'll call H delta L um, of Z, Z bar, and this is the solution of the Casimir equation, which is defined to be the solution with this form, the solution whose leading term is this with corrections that are integer powers of eta and sigma. This is sometimes called G-pure for one of the, the, uh, the G-pure conformal blocks. I think you should be worried about it. I think that we should view this as an asymptotic expansion, um, which is, I don't know about rigorously, but basically rigorously okay as long as you keep a finite number of terms in eta. In, eta. in expansion in eta. As long as we keep a finite terms, I think we're totally safe doing that. Uh, for the leading terms, you can show that very explicitly using light cone bootstrap. I think it's true for any finite number of terms. When we get to an infinite number of terms, I don't, I don't know to what extent it makes so sense to do this. Probably not. Today, you're going to be projecting out some particular L. Yeah. So you only sort of need to trust it up to that value of L, and then you can say something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. Think I got 
Okay, so um, let's try to invert this. Okay, so um, nothing fancy. We're just going to read off. You know, we're trying to pick off a particular OP coefficient c squared delta l. So let's try to just pick off the one that we want. Um, so a formula that we might try is the following: c squared delta l equals question mark. This formula is not quite true. Kappa delta plus L over 2. Um, I'm putting some factors back in that I dropped over there. Um, time is the real part of the integral d sigma over the semicircular contour near the origin. Sigma to the L minus 2. Eta to the minus tau over 2 minus 1. Um, G minus 1. And we should pick off the eta inverse term. I've written this in sort of a funny way. OK, so I, here I'm just doing a residue. I'm just picking off the right power of sigma by doing a residue term. And then I'm just declaring that I'm going to pick off the corresponding power of eta. So this is, there's a bunch of powers of eta here. Um, and I'm just saying that we should first pick off the spin L sigma residue, and then um, depending on which operator we want, that tells us which power of eta to pick off. OK, so this is a totally reasonable thing to try. Um, it's almost, what? Well, I, it's the same as this. Uh, it's the same, as the same reason as before, that the real part of the semicircle is the same as the um, closed contour without the real part. So just to pick off a residue. But the reason that I wrote it that way um, is because then we can deform the contour and we get kappa delta plus L over 4 times the integral d sigma from 0 to 1 of sigma to the L minus 2 eta to the minus tau over 2 minus 1. times d disk g and you're supposed to pick off the eta inverse term. So what I've done in this step uh, is exactly what we did in the derivation of the annex sum rule. Um, we just took this semicircle contour and deformed it down to the real line and then on the real line we used real part of g minus 1 is the d disk. Yes, let's see. Um, at small eta, where we're doing an expansion like this, uh, this is just zero away from the origin. So it's the same as before. It's like we, we, can, we can write it from zero to one, but it's really all coming from close to zero. These are the physical, right. That you know somebody told you already where the spectrum is and you want to pick out the spectrum. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay, so what I've, what I've just done on, on this board um, was the original derivation of the ANEC type sum rules. It's literally the same argument that we were doing for the derivation of the ANEC. Um, and this was a formula that we wrote for leading twist operators um, based, on, based on exactly this argument. Um, so what I want to um, explain is first exactly how this is related to the ANEC and then how we got the rest of the inversion formula. So first let me say what I mean by when I say this is the same as what we discussed for the ANEC. So in the ANEC case, um, 
we're, we're talking about trying to pick off the conformal block for stress tensor exchange. Um, so we're trying to pick off uh, the OP coefficient for this term. And uh, the contribution of this term to the correlator is something like C O O T times I eta over sigma. This is in four dimensions. This is the same I eta over sigma that we found in the aneg derivation. Now I'm just phrasing it in terms of conformal blocks. If you take the stress tensor conformal block, you go around the pole, you head back towards the origin, you could just do that calculation, um, and it's I eta over sigma. So the annex sum rule says C O O T is equal to O times the annex uh, is equal to the expectation value of the annex is equal to the integral d sigma of d disk g eta inverse. So I've, that's just this formula. It's the OP, I should put squared. Squared, squared. So the OP coefficient uh, for the stress tensor that corresponds to this contribution, um, this formula is actually correct. It actually, it, it is inverting this piece of the OPE. And how is the first equality clear here? This one? No. That, that one. Yeah. Um, because there's an integral uh, It's not obvious from, from, it's not immediately obvious, mm -hmm. but um, since we're working in the same regime, so, how do I want to say this? Um, For scalar operators, it's obvious because there's only one OPE coefficient. Well, let me put it this way. If we knew the first equality already, yeah. why did we need to prove the annex? Because then it's clear that it's already Exactly. Clear. Yeah. So that's because for scalars, the annex is trivial. For scalars, the annex just tells you about the OPE coefficient OOT, which, is, which has the right sign by the word identity. Uh -huh. um, the annex is really only interesting when some of the operators are not scalars. In mixed scalar states, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why is the crystal separation point a problem? Why is it a problem? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it's a problem. I just am not sure that we can use this expansion right, anymore the when. Right. Exactly at this point, so, uh, the what? The, the double discontinuity. Should. But the infinite sum of double, the infinite sum of double twist operators, will resum to something that does contribute to the d-disk. So then I'm not sure that we can make sense of it with an asymptotic <coughs> sum like this. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so the point I wanted to make is just that the ANEC is some particular OP coefficient, basically, um, in the context of these four-point functions. The ANEC is some particular OP coefficient, uh, so the ANEC sum rule is some particular inversion formula for that OP coefficient. Um, now, let's go back um, to this question mark formula, and now what I want to do is compare this um, to the full inversion formula. So let's call this star, and we want to compare star carrying you all. So the full inver inversion formula is um, C of delta comma L equals kappa delta plus L 
over 2, integral dz bar, integral dz, 0 to 1, mu cz bar, g l plus d minus 1, delta plus 1 minus d, zz bar, times d disk. This is not the same uh, thing that's showing up over there. This is the um, OPE coefficient function, and it has poles at the physical spectrum. So this has poles that look like minus c squared delta i li over delta minus delta i. And these poles uh, come from a region of the integral that's, we have to, you have to get a pole somehow, and the poles come from the small z or small z bar region of the integral. I'm going to call it the small z bar. region of the integral. If we're allowed to do an expansion, if, if we're allowed to look at the integrand and expand in z bar, um, then what that means is these poles have to come from particular powers of z bar that are showing up there. Um, so the physical OP coefficient c squared delta L or kappa delta plus L over 4. And now I'm going to translate into these sigma eta variables, d sigma 0 to 1, mu eta sigma, g L plus d minus 1, delta plus 1 minus d times d disk. And the poles come from uh, the small z bar region of this integral. So if you want to get the appropriate pole, um, you have to look for the appropriate power of z bar in the integrand, uh, and that corresponds to just picking off the eta inverse term. I'm cheating a little bit here for the reasons that David explained in his lecture, which is that um, it's this is really a formula for the, for C of delta L. And if you want to go to the physical poles, you should worry about whether it converges, whether you're doing an asymptotic expansion, uh, exactly whether it makes sense. Um, I'm not really going to have anything to say about that. I'll just assume that we can do this manipulation. And it may require that we're doing an asymptotic expansion in spin. Um, it basically, we're basically doing a um, Mellon type integral in, in eta. Okay. And the way you get a particular pole in delta from this z bar integral is um, if you have a particular power of eta. Oh, did I? Um, yeah. Eta remains inside the Um yeah, the, these both have eta's in them. And if you look at, and this is a simple, this is a simple pole, so it has to come from a eta inverse term. That's right. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. And what I'm deriving here is not the, the full power of the inversion formula. I'm just trying to show how these two things fit together. Okay. That's all. OK, so these formulas look pretty similar. Um, this one 
just doesn't have the funny block. Okay, so, so this, this one with the question mark in it, which we derived by just basically, ins just by inspection. You know, what did we, how, did we, how did we come to this formula? We just started expanding conformal blocks and picking off the powers of sigma and eta that we wanted. Um, and we got the right answer sort of up to um, this kernel. So now I want to explain from this point of view where that kernel comes from. The point is that when we made this guess over here, uh, we assumed sort of a generic spectrum. We, as we, we said we wanted to pick off a particular power of eta, a particular power of sigma, uh, and we did a residue integral to pick that off. But that assumes that we're not going to get that same power in, of eta and sigma from some other operator. So if, if there are other operators around, it might get contaminated by them. Okay, so, but star assumed a generic spectrum. In general, it's contaminated by operators with tau prime equal to tau minus 2m, L prime greater than or equal to L, and m a non-negative integer. Why is that? Well, just stare at the formula. You know, if, if you have, um, for example, if, if you have two things that, whose twist just differs by two, then the subleading eta in one of them is going to contaminate that power of eta that you were trying to, that you were trying to get here. Similarly, um, if you wanted the stress tensor, which was the spin two term, but there was a conserved spin four current, then some of the subleading powers in sigma are going to contaminate your answer for the stress tensor. Okay, so if you, if you um, have contamination like this, um, then you need to modify the kernel to cancel this problem. That's something you can do completely by brute force. Okay, so what do you do? You take this kernel and you start adding subleading powers of sigma and eta to the kernel in order to cancel the bad terms that you, the, these contamination of other operators. So like, if you want the next, if you want the next, if you want the first correction to this in, in sigma, then you just demand that spin four operators are canceled. If you want the next correction in sigma, you demand that spin six operators get canceled. Similarly in eta, if you want the next correction in eta, you demand that these operators get canceled. Um, you can do that by brute force, but uh, there's a smarter way to do it um, okay, so if you do that by brute force, you're going to end up with a kernel that's sigma to the L minus 2, eta to the minus tau over 2 minus 1, times 1 plus integer powers of eta and sigma. Uh, but the smarter way to do it is just to note that the thing that's orthogonal is going to be a solution the Casimir equation that I'll call K delta L. And this obeys a very simple orthogonality property, integral d eta, integral d sigma, mu of eta sigma, k delta plus 2m comma l, h delta plus 2m prime, l prime equals delta 
M, M prime delta L, L prime. Um, so K, so H is the, I guess I just erased H. H is the um, thing that's showing up in the conformal block expansion. K is the thing I just talked about. It's the, it's what you get by starting with this kernel and then correcting it into a solution of the Casimir equation. So H is a solution of the Casimir equation that goes as eta to the tau over 2 over sigma to the L minus 1, and K is a solution of the Casimir equation that goes as that, sigma to the L minus 2, eta to the minus tau over 2 plus 1. And um, this is, I think, a, a, a version of some of the orthogonality relations that um, David talked about and that showed up in the light, co in the light ray paper. Um, although this one is a little simpler um, to actually think about the integrals because these are just residue integrals. This is not some fancy um, harmonic analysis that we're doing here. Well, it is harmonic analysis, but it's not fancy harmonic analysis. Uh, these, are just, these are just residue integrals. This is just a residue integral of a polynomial. Because when you do the the only thing that's not a polynomial is the is the is the eta to the minus tau over two, but that cancels the eta to the plus tau over two over here. So this is just an orthogonal polynomial problem, um, and it's very easy to check uh, that this identity is true. Um, since I'm out of time, I'll just say the last step in words. Um, so. We're almost there. We're, we've almost com we almost have matched uh, the inversion formula to the to the simple-minded inversion formula by by correcting for these um, degenerate operators. Uh, but we didn't quite get the same kernel. What I called K is not quite uh, is not quite the kernel. So let me let me write that. that This becomes K delta L. Uh, this is not quite Simone's kernel. Um, however, uh, it's almost the same. So G Simone is equal to K delta L minus K D minus delta comma L. Uh, so it has a contribution also from the shadow poles, from the shadow operators. And as long as we're talking about the OP coefficients of the physical operators, the physical spectrum, then um, this thing never contributes anyway uh, to the physical OP coefficients. So as far as calculating, so as, as far as this formula is concerned, like you know the spectrum, you just want to calculate the physical OP coefficients on the physical spectrum, um, it's exactly the same as what we got by this, by this simple argument. I'm going to make a couple of comments about this, and then I'll be done. Uh, yeah, it's just in the, yeah, right there. That's just in order to make them orthogonal. Okay, some comments. Um, first of all, this simple argument gives us the full inversion kernel, but I would not say this is not a, really a derivation of the inversion formula. The inversion formula um, is this non-perturbative upper line. That, it's this non-perturbative statement there about um, that full function C um, and doesn't require any of this any of these asymptotic expansions that I've done in this argument. Um, so I wouldn't really say that, I wouldn't really say this is a derivation of the full formula. I think for that you still need the more sophisticated methods. Um, maybe, maybe there's some way to understand 
why this is good enough, but the argument that I just gave is really only for the asymptotic expansion. Um, the last thing I want to say uh, is just about the D-disk. of individual conformal blocks. Okay, so um, usually 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 when people talk about this formula, um, they would say that the that if we plug in individual conformal blocks into this D disk, then they vanish. And it's only doing the infinite sum over conformal blocks that you actually get contributions to the D disk. Okay, so that's why, um, that's why the original formula wasn't derived this way. Um, but I think there's a subtlety there. Now it's true that the discontinuity of the discontinuity of an individual conformal block is zero. That's easy to check. Um, so in a, in a hands-on way, the, the individual conformal blocks have terms in them that are like log of 1 minus z. Okay, so there are no log squares in the individual conformal block. If you take a discontinuity, it's, the branch cuts are gone. You take another discontinuity, you get zero. Okay, so the discontinuity of the discontinuity is zero. Um, but I think we should be careful about defining the double discontinuity of a function that's singular at the origin, as the individual blocks are, unlike the full correlator. Um, and um, if we instead define the double discontinuity um, to be the real part of the, sing of the single discontinuity, then this is not zero. Yeah, so let me give an example. Which is the four-dimensional stress tensor. Um, the discontinuity of the stress tensor conformal block is um, the thing that we keep talking about. It's I8 over sigma. Or in cross-ratio language, that's I z bar over z squared. So the, the, conformal, the individual conformal blocks are singular near the origin on the second sheet. The full correlator is not. So the full correlator doesn't have this problem. And the full correlator, you can use whichever definition you want, and they agree with each other. But in the individual blocks, there are these singularities near the origin. And so like in this example, um, the real part of the discontinuity of the stress tensor block uh, picks up a delta function from this i over sigma. So this is eta. delta of sigma. So there are delta, the point is that there are delta function contributions to the double discontinuity um, from individual conformal blocks. And that's basically what's, that's basically what made this work, is that um, it, once, once you account for that delta function contribution, uh, this formula does sort of become a tautology in the light cone limit, because you take an individual conformal block and plug it in here, and that gives a delta function. You do the integral, and that gives you the coefficient of the delta function. So in this, in this Lycon expansion, that's exactly how the inversion formula is working. So yeah. I thought the i eta over sigma was just part of the block and not discontinuity of the block? Or yeah, there are other terms, but they're not singular. So I just, so those, those don't contribute here. There are, there are regular terms as well. Uh, th there's plus regular, plus but those don't contribute here. 
because um, it's i times regular, and those don't have a real part. It's only i times singular that has a real part. Okay, thank you. I'll take questions. <laughs> if there, if anybody has any energy left for questions, yeah. What do you mean? If you what? I mean, they, they come with, they come with, they're, they're not just delta functions. The higher spin stuff will have derivatives of delta functions, and they come with different powers of eta. So it's not just that they each have a delta function. They have some crazy distribution worth of delta functions that. Exactly. So I think this would be. You just upgrade it to that and you're done. Exactly. So I think, like, if anyone wants to derive an inversion formula on some other manifold or in some other theory or whatever, like, the next time you want to derive an inversion formula, this might be a really easy way to get the right answer with very little work. Um, I agree. Sorry? Yeah, it, ch it changes the analytic properties of this function. So if you don't have the shadow block, this will not be nicely behaved at, at, at large delta, and you won't be able to do some of the contour manipulations that we like to do. But it doesn't, af it doesn't affect this formula. Okay.